these compounds were so demonized. The whole area was so discredited that we had this phenomenon in which for, you know, better than 30 years, uh, the consensus opinion was this research was too dangerous or too edgy to be done. We started our work with psilocybin in about 2000. It was difficult, but we got approved. People who are eligible for our trial are people who have anxiety and or depression secondary to their cancer diagnosis. And they are struggling with these existential questions of life and death and their own psychological discomfort. They go through two days of screening in which they receive a physical exam, extensive uh, psychiatric and psychological testing. Uh, mm -hmm. and Julie, and uh, oh. no, so after preparation, the volunteers schedule for their psilocybin sessions. What we would want and hope for them is that they have an experience that's uplifting and alters their perceptual set in a way that makes uh, the remainder of their life and their uh, struggle with their disease process uh, something that's really quite manageable for them. The prognosis was very poor. There were so many treatments, and since I have a scientific background, I got very preoccupied with researching everything, you know, micromanaging. And um, <clears throat> so my life just kind of got narrower and narrower. I got more exclusively focused on the cancer. And uh, uh, I uh, became more withdrawn. Uh, Finally, my uh, daughter and friends uh, sort of told me that I needed to do something. But I had no previous experience with uh, uh, psychedelics, so I didn't know what to expect exactly. Looks like this is for you. A high proportion of volunteers have what's called a primary mystical type experience. And they're absolutely sure that this experience is more real than everyday waking reality. And it's that element, I believe, that imprints this experience into people's consciousness in a way that has huge value going forward. The beginning of the okay. effects start in about 10 minutes. And it's uh, like your brain is going offline, you know, one part at a time. And I tell people the story to make it a little clearer. Since I do a lot of sailing, if you're out in the open ocean and you were to fall off your boat, you turn around and the boat's gone. And then pretty soon the water's gone. And then you're gone. You don't have any sense of self anymore. Okay. Good. Is that comfortable? That's good. Okay. I'll put some headphones on you. Okay. Okay. And remember to let us know how the volume is, if you want it higher or lower. Okay. And, um... For the first hour and a half, it was pretty frightening because I was fighting it. I was resisting. I wanted to open my eyes and make things snap back into place. If the, I didn't have the help of the people there, I would have left the room and tried to walk around and get things to focus back in again, you know, to look familiar again. So the uh, supervision, I think, is very important.
Yeah, after about an hour and a half, I calmed down. At one point, I thought I might be in a cathedral, and uh, I thought that it might be a good chance to talk with God. <laughs> so I, you know, just in my mind, I said, well, you know, if there was ever a good time, this is it. So, you know, talk to me. <laughs> and nothing happened. I did it again, and nothing happened. There was just an experience of familiarity or tranquility. And uh, during that time, I could pull up past relationships or current relationships and look at them in great detail. And um, uh, um, it was as if I was um, Sorry. The depression itself lifted. I might fall into a depression, but I can pull myself out of it pretty easily. It fundamentally changes the way you approach the world. So you're, you're opening out instead of narrowing down into a negative spiral. It's almost unbelievable that after one day, and not any follow-up medications or anything, that this could happen.